what what kills toads, right? And like, how do we know that when we try different things on, on worms, like, you know, that actually it's not affecting the cause of death of nematodes. Yeah, it, that's a great point. And people have been looking into it. You know, there's studies out there that investigates, you know, one of the most common causes of death in C. elegans is actually uh, colonization by the bacteria that they live on. So they lose the ability to break down the uh, E. coli that they're commonly fed in a lab setting. And that breakdown eventually leads to the E. coli proliferating in their body and essentially running rampant as an infection. thing that I think is useful is that the age-associated breakdown of the grinding organ that they have to break down those cells, it's age-associated. And so do aging interventions even then at a cellular, cellular level work to prolong the animal's resilience against that bacteria? And it is really, you, you hit on a nail on the, the head that I, I, I'm always wary of getting too defensive as a model-driven scientist. And I think even the mice people get defensive about their work is that no model system is going to be perfect. And I, I've always thought of it in terms of, uh, are you familiar with the Drake equation? No. So it was the proposal for what's the likelihood that there's intelligent life in the universe. And so yeah, it's, like it's, 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 paradox, it's just, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you multiply the number of stars by the number of fraction that have planets and so on and so forth. And so I think of direct discovery along the same lines. I think that C. elegans and mice and even the other model systems people use, they're all just ways to improve our fraction of success. 